Hello, and welcome to the New Relic Modern Software Podcast, the show where New Relic experts and sometimes special guests discuss the top trends and topics in the world of software applications, DevOps, cloud computing, monitoring, and today, serverless. I'm your host, Frederick Paul, Editor-in-Chief of New Relic. For this episode, we're experimenting with a slightly different format. Instead of our usual freeform discussion of a particular topic, my co-host, New Relic developer evangelist Tori Will. Hey, Fred. And I welcome New Relic's Lee Atchison and Clay Smith to a no-holds-barred debate on the age-old question, or maybe a brand new question, is serverless technology ready for prime time? Stay tuned, it could get heated. Ding, ding. Before we get started deconstructing the promise and reality of serverless, though, some super fast housekeeping. First, you can find edited transcripts of recent episodes of the New Relic Modern Software Podcast on the New Relic blog, blog.newrelic.com, and that's also where to look for associated links, images, and other ephemera that are connected to the podcast. Second, for listeners who may not be familiar with us, I want to say a quick word about New Relic. Built entirely in the cloud, the New Relic platform lets you know exactly what's happening in your software and systems in real time. You can know the impact of every change, find and fix errors faster, get all your teams on the same page, and innovate more confidently. Want to find out more? Go to my favorite site on the internet, newrelic.com. Welcome, Lee. Welcome, Clay. Hello. Well, hello, Fred. Thank you for inviting us. So just to put everything in perspective before we dig into the whole serverless thing, uh, I, I want to give a little background on, on who our guests are. So developer advocate Clay Smith is known around the office as Clay Burnettis, <laughs> which doesn't always make him so happy, but we love it. Uh, he's been a senior software engineer at several early stage startup companies and has been building serverless solutions for many years now from mobile backends to real-time APIs with AWS. And Clay will be defending the idea that serverless is ready for prime time and software shops need to start moving in that direction as soon as they can. You ready for this, Clay? I think so, yeah. Lee, meanwhile, is Senior Director of Strategic Architecture here at New Relic, where he focuses on cloud architecture, microservices, scalability, and availability. He's the author of Architecting for Scale, published by O'Reilly. Notably, before joining New Relic, he spent seven years in Amazon and was instrumental in the early development of Elastic Beanstalk at Amazon Web Services. Lee will be taking the opposite position, that whatever it promises down the line, serverless is not yet ready for prime time, and software organizations should take a wait-and-see approach to using it in production. Is that right, Lee? Sure. <laughs> no, that sounds great. I, I love this uh, this level of commitment here. Uh, so, um, <laughs> <laughs> of course, the reality is somewhere in the middle there. So, yeah. Tori, and Tori, what what are, what are you and I going to be doing? Oh, uh, we're going to be baiting them so we can get the energy level up. That's I think that's what we're going to uh, do. I'm going to be ducking and trying to stay out of the crowd. No, I, I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to throw some raw meat in the middle and see if we can get people to go for well, it. All right. Well, why don't you toss out the first chunk? Enough background. Let's jump in. Is the hype around serverless justified? Will it ever? be justified round one go for it you know it, it's it's interesting because i don't know especially after you've been in software for a few years the answer to any question like that is always it depends, depends. yes and that the weaseling begins no, <laughs> no, no, the, the, the weaseling uh, is basically immediate on this um yeah you know i think serverless is following a, a tired and true hype cycle as have many other things i think what makes serverless interesting and where uh, the debate gets heated is, it, as others have said, it effectively, it effectively stamps in a, in a big, big way, deprecated on a ton of technology. Yeah. And I empathize with, with people and, and engineers who maybe spent the past three years building out a container platform or something around that. Because when you consider the emergence of serverless, it definitely puts that investment or that knowledge at risk. So I, I understand that. But I don't think that's an excuse to ignore it. So, Fred, I think you're going to find, unfortunately, that Clay and I agree more than we disagree, which is oh, doesn't make a good argument. But we'll, we'll, we'll work on that. I don't a think we're going to let that stand. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, you know, I, I, I completely agree with Clay in general. There, there is absolute hype that's going on here. I think there is some reality here, though, and that is the, the cost of running an infrastructure is a real cost that companies have to go along with. And the promise of serverless is to reduce or eliminate that cost. And, you know, it's that promise is a hype promise. You know, it's never going to go away. There's always going to be infrastructure costs. Um, you're always going to have to deal with it. 
But what serverless really promises is to be able to manage that and control that in a way that reduces your investment into, in the, into the infrastructure and allow you to scale in a way that's distinct and independent of the infrastructure cost itself. Okay, so let's back up. We threw the meat in the middle of the table, but let's let's start with definitions. Uh, what is serverless? How do you define the term, Clay? I will I'll take my favorite definition from Paul Johnston, who um, I think is I think his current title is senior developer advocate at AWS. He has a really nice one sentence way to describe it: a serverless solution is something that costs nothing if no one is using it, excluding data storage costs. Okay, that's a great definition. Uh, even a more basic. Definition is serverless is something that doesn't require servers that are exposed to you and exposed for you to have to deal with. So what I what do I mean by that? A cloud infrastructure component that you do not have to understand the server architecture that it runs on is serverless. If you have to understand the architecture it runs on, it is not serverless. So for those of you familiar with AWS, Elastic Load Balancer is not serverless because you have to understand the servers that underline it, the size of them, how they scale, et cetera. Lambda is serverless. It obviously still runs on servers, but you don't care what servers it runs on. You don't have to allocate those servers. You don't have to deal with the servers. It is all transparent to you. You're not charged based on them. You're not scaled based on them. You do not have to understand how they work. There are lots and lots and lots of services that are serverless. Uh, not just Lambda. S3 is serverless. DynoDB is serverless. It's a database storage mechanism that you do not have to understand anything about the underlying servers that it runs on. So you've mostly been mentioning AWS services. Obviously, there are serverless stuff outside of that uh, ecosystem as well. Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, uh, Azure Cloud Functions, uh, Google, I think their product is still in beta. Given all that, what are the... What's the problem that this is supposed to solve? Um, I think maybe you got at it a little bit uh, by not spending money on stuff you're not using. And maybe, Lee, you got at it a little bit by, by not having to understand it. You know, what, what is it really, though, that we're, that, that's broke here that we're trying to fix? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll take this question from the developer angle, angle okay. which, I mean, there's, there's a lot of different ways to slice it. Cost, infrastructure management, you know, operational toil. From the developer perspective, it's really compelling because it allows you to focus much more significantly on code and things like scaling. Well, so I'll I'll, dis I'll start disagreeing with Clay a little bit here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> now the fun begins. Now, uh, you know, it's honestly I think for the true developer, whether it's serverless or not, is mostly irrelevant because they're mostly not concerned about the infrastructure it's running on. Anyway. That's someone else's problem. Exactly. Still. Yeah. Now DevOps muddies that, and certainly somebody involved in a DevOps shop does care about the infrastructure it runs on, but it's a different role that they're doing within their team to decide what infrastructure to run an application on that's different than the role of developing the application. Now, I would actually argue that the development of the application, one of the disadvantages of you know, the Lambda style serverless, which is what I think most people think of when they say serverless. One of the disadvantages of it is it puts requirements on the developer on what they're allowed to do within their application more so than other infrastructure technologies do. Uh, and language requirements, uh, compute time requirements, stack size requirements. Uh, the, the problem is they have to think about the infrastructure early in the design and development of their application versus if they're using other technologies. I think maybe another way to put it is the promise of benefits is alluring until you get into the weeds. And once you're in the weeds, the promise isn't nearly as strong of a promise as it appears to be. There's never a silver bullet in software engineering. There's, there's a fundamental difficulty of design in architecture. Yeah. And that's, that's not going away with any solution. A few years ago, I needed to host a static web page. It was for a small internal application. The process was I had to open a Jira ticket with operations. And then two weeks later, they gave me a static web server. Now, I mean, and forget Lambda. I mean, now, you know, if there's an internal S3 bucket as a developer, you know, there's not really even necessarily anything interesting operationally going on there. It's just like, well, yeah, just put the files there and, and I'm good to go. 
Well, now I completely agree with you, but we're talking more of the benefit of the cloud there versus the benefit of serverless. I mean, you can do the same thing with allocating the servers you need to run an application. If, I mean, one of the advantages of the cloud is me as a developer, I don't Scale. have to rely on an operations team. I can do what I need to do to get my job done because I have the tools available to me. Right, but there's still something else that you need to do there. And with serverless, you wouldn't have to do it at all. You do something I, different. I, uh, yeah, okay. Right. Well, right. So well, there's always a surprise. Point, I think. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I would maybe push back a little bit because that was a cloud example. That was running on AWS. They created an EC2 instance. They put the static web server on the instance. So, oh, I mean, wow. you know, I, I think maybe there's a level of cloud sophistication or, or maybe there's a broader movement towards managed services. I mean, I think perhaps like a lot of the benefits of serverless, you know, Lambda side is really just people's greater sophistication of being able to use the hundreds of AWS managed services. That's a perfect, perfect uh, uh, way of describing it. And I think you hit on something really, really solid there. The, the request that you ran into where you had that difficulty to actually create the instance had nothing to do with the complexity of the task. It had to do with the operations requirements behind the process of creating that task. You could have created your own AWS account, launched an EC2 instance, and a half an hour later had your your website up and running. I think it's a it changes what you have to deal with, but I don't think it simplifies what you have to deal with at the developer level. So, Lee, is that a, is that an issue of the current state of the technology, or is it fundamental to the concept of serverless? No, it's the current state of the technology. So, at some point, it could relieve that, not just change it, but make it go away. Absolutely. And I think one of the things that's happened recently, some people would argue whether it's recent or not, uh, that has helped with that is kind of the merging that's been going on between the a container approach to developing applications and serverless. And so ECS uh, uh, Fargate is probably a good example of that. It's trying to merge the ideas. Now, people will say, Google's been doing this for a while. Microsoft's been doing this for a while. People that's fine. Like, people like Clay, like might Clay, say this? for instance, might say that. <laughs> and and that's and that's fine. He I'm is not here. Disagreeing. We can let him say it for himself. <laughs> he certainly can. I'm not disagreeing with that. But I think what's happened is AWS legitimized that approach. I don't know. I I would personally not call Fargate serverless though. In many ways, what I think the perfect world is is the ability to take a container and launch it like you do a Lambda function, and you can say, I want. Um, and number of instances, maybe, or you tell me how many I need and automatically make them run correctly and just make it all work and not have to worry at all about the server infrastructure underneath. Now, a Fargate is a step in that direction, but you're absolutely right. It is not there yet either. It's a technology step. I think the the future of that is extremely interesting and, yeah, completely agree that, uh, you know, the, the line could continue to blur as, yeah. as the, the tech advances. And like one thing that surprised me, though, is uh, servers or virtual machines, you know, regardless <laughs> of, of how you feel about serverless and, and Lambda, no one's sticking up for servers. Are we busy sure. hugging them just a few years ago? Yeah, I mean, they were our pets, right? Right, yeah. and yeah. now they're our cattle, and now they're I mean, like, we've all gone vegan or what? <laughs> Is that where we're going with servers? Obviously, you think so, Clay. The virtual machine industry is still in the billions of dollars. But the life of this stuff seems relatively long, and I don't think serverless fundamentally changes that. So and we'll still be you. talking about servers for a while? Nostalgically, okay. maybe? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, I think when someone makes a tribute music video to their favorite server, we'll, we'll know yeah. we've, we've hit peak nostalgia, but... um. We're, we're stuck with him for a long time. I think really what might be the heart of the disagreement that Clay and I have is what's the ultimate sweet spot? Mm. I, I personally think the sweet spot is closer to containers as a service. I think Clay probably thinks it's closer to functions as a service, as a sweet spot. And yeah, I'm putting words in your mouth. Please disagree <laughs> or, or otherwise. Podcast listeners cannot see the pained expression on Clay's face. <laughs> um. I think ultimately people are going to have to choose which pattern makes the most sense for what they're trying to build. And I do think that, you know, one of the key benefits of containers is there is some some sense of a lift and shift approach for containers from VMs to containers that does not exist for serverless. Yeah. And more than that, the required skills to build a really complex serverless solution, not only are the tools immature, but you also have to be fairly familiar with event-driven programming. 
there's clearly a need for greater knowledge around that type of software architecture. Do I think that banks are going to replace their mainframes with serverless the next five years? Well, no, of course not. They haven't replaced them yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and right, there's been plenty of good reasons before now. Yeah, you're right, they're not. Um, I, and I think you kind of hit maybe the nail on the head there too. That is, you, you clarified by saying a class of problem. And I think you're absolutely right. There's a class of problem that function-based computing is perfectly aligned with. Sure. I hear customers on the fringe, some of the fringe customers are saying, we're going to use functions as a service for everything that we do from now on moving forward. And when I hear comments like that, I, I try not to gag in front of them, but it's very <laughs> hard because, uh, you know, functions as a service has value, but it's, it has a lot of disadvantages too. And it's, you just really have to use the right tool for the right job. What's going to move to functions as a service is a more specialized class of computing that's better utilized for that type of, of, a, of programming. And that includes smaller applications. It includes um, certain types of applications, including, for instance, uh, high-speed data processing, uh, data, data, uh, data conversion, data handling, those sorts of things that are very specific focused, very event-driven, very data flow focused, those sorts of applications are going to work very well with functions as a service. We will have uh, the need for EC2 in, in containers for a very long time. The, the kind of wild card um, I, I see in that is, what are, what's the next class of managed services that the different cloud providers are going to release? Yeah. Um, they keep moving higher and higher up the stack. So Lambda aside, instead of buying some sort of enterprise storage box for $500,000. Now you just use S3. Yep. And that's, you know, instead of the uh, the very kind of resource heavy model of like, well, I'm going to buy storage and compute. Well, maybe you're just going to use API gateway and integrate with a third party SaaS tool like Twilio if you want to notify your customers or something. So I think part of the wild card isn't necessarily, um, am I going to move to serverless or, um, or, or containers? It's, do I even need to run this code myself anymore, or can I just buy it off the shelf? You know, that's that's a fantastic point because I, one of the uh, the advantages of of functions as a computing that I was trying to think of and couldn't think of before is as glue. It's very good to act as glue, connecting services of different types together for different purposes, even just AWS services together, but certainly other people's services as well. And it's very good at that. And and you're right as as cloud providers go further up the value curve, as SaaS providers go further up the value curve and provide these higher level services, in some cases, building an application is less about programming and more about gluing things together. And as we get into that sort of model, then absolutely the glue that people are going to be using are, are going to be things like Lambda, functions as a service. That's going to be more prevalent in that model than container-based and, and more traditional compute. Yeah. Uh, the real question is, how long until we hmm. get there? Yeah. <laughs> and, and is real traditional computing going away? And if so, who's building those services? I tend to think more that it, we're not going towards computing going away. It's service connection is what really matters. But it's a layering model, right? There's, there's, there's people at the high end that are going to be doing that. And the people at the next layer down, they're going to be gluing smaller components together and building some things themselves. And that's going to go on. All, all the way down the stack. And there's always going to be building things and there's always going to be gluing things uh, until AI starts doing it for <laughs> you, right? <laughs> the glue approach versus five or 10 years ago is becoming more and more attractive for lots of different types of applications. And we're seeing continued investment from all the major clouds, um, maybe Azure more than uh, Google at this point of, yeah. of kind of going in that direction, which is super compelling. I have yet to talk to any customers that have really doubled down on that approach, but it seems like there's a lot of wishful thinking that the industry would go that way. I see there's definitely going to be a much more focus on the higher level service integration as the key to building applications. I, I, it's, it's, you can't disagree with that. I think that's, that is the way that some of the cloud providers want us to go. Well, so you, you, we're looking forward here, and I think this is maybe a good way to, to put a cap on this. So where do we think the state of serverless will be a year from now in, in 2019 or, or in 2020? You know, where are we going to get to? Can What's sort of the optimistic projection there, Clay? And maybe what's the, 
I don't want to say the, pessimist. Yeah, don't call me the pessimist. I'm not the pessimist here. We'll give you realistic. Okay, okay. Do you like that yeah, better? Yeah, sure, okay. that sounds good. Um, <laughs> I don't think Clay does. But. So, well, <laughs> right. and, and, and that's a little unfair to, to Clay. But, but you, know, w- you know, best case scenario, where are we going here? I think uh, 2020, best case scenario, a, a cloud, a public cloud customer will weigh all their options. And in terms of building a new solution, I'm, you're building something net new, even if it integrates with older legacy things. The number of times you can say, I'm going to use serverless for this is over 50%. Okay. And Lee, what's what's your take on that? With the general use of the word serverless, I would agree with Clay. I think the question is the type of serverless. And I think there's going to be more and more use of serverless, but I don't think that's necessarily going to translate into functions as a service. And I think what's going to happen actually is there'll be more of a whiplash effect that people will try and use functions as a service and will end up suddenly back to more of a midpoint where, you know, we're, we're going to be using lots of different things and functions as a service and Lambda, things like that are one of the tools we're going to be using, but not the only tool. There's more and more services are going to be serverless, like S3 is serverless. More and more services will be like that. And I do think containers as a service it's going to become truly serverless over the next couple of years as well. But Lambda functions as a service is uh, on the way up a hype cycle that it's going to come back down from. I, I think those are fascinating scenarios that you guys have posed, but I have, I have a quick question. Clay, what needs to happen in order to get that vision of that best case scenario uh, to occur in, in the next year or two? It, it comes down to people and training. The number of qualified people that have production serverless solution experience is very small. And we've seen, you know, great programs, different AWS certifications that, you know, aspirationally will get people there. But when it comes down to it, the number of people that can jump in to this sort of software pattern where everything is event driven, even if they're coming from, you know, a different, maybe more enterprise context where there's some of those similar patterns. The number of those people is just very, very small. So there's there's this knowledge that people have to gain both to qualify whether this pattern makes sense, but if they do, you know, actually build and architect it successfully. And that's um, as we know from other situations and and historically in uh, in software engineering, that can take some time. Lee, what needs to happen to get past your scenario? So I think there needs to be some industry growth in containers as a service. We need improvements to Fargate technology. We need improvements to the offerings that Amazon, uh, Azure, and Google provide in order to make that the right stable platform in the future. And I think there needs to be a realization of what the value is of functions as a service. And and people need to spend time looking at them to come to the conclusion of deciding which of those two directions is the right direction for their particular problem case. Well, that wraps a truly unique episode of the New Relic Modern Software Podcast. Sincere thanks to Tori Wilt, as always, to Clay Bernetti-Smith and Lee (laughs) Atchison for a great debate. And thanks to our audio engineer, Vinny Garcia. We're interested in your feedback. What do you think of serverless? Did Lee or Clay change your mind on anything? Please feel free to tell us what you think on Twitter, hashtag Modern Software Podcast, and in this case, maybe hashtag serverless. We'd also love to hear what you think of this episode's point-counterpoint format. To avoid missing upcoming episodes, you can subscribe to the New Relic Modern Software Podcast on Apple Podcasts. You know, that service that used to be called iTunes. And we'd love to have you rate us there as well. I'm Frederick Paul. Thanks for listening to the New Relic Modern Software Podcast. And remember, New Relic, because you need to know right now.